All right. So here is our first slide. Um, so I'm Anna Haynes, and I'm with the Center for Land Use Education, which is part of UW Extension and the College of Natural Resources at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. So I'm the moderator today. I have a few slides as we get started, and then we will move into our speakers. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to all of our sponsors. There's quite a number of them, and I am not going to uh, read all of those. Hopefully all of you can see the slides. I, I just wanted to make one comment that we are recording this, and so we will make the webinar available online some way, shape, or form. You'll all um, get a notification of that. And APA Wisconsin also is offering continuing education credits for this. All right, here's our agenda for today. Uh, I will be making some opening comments, then Dr. Crispin Pierce from UW-Eau Claire will be talking about Fraxand and the re related health risks. Dr. John Richards uh, from, I think it's DNR Air Control Techniques will be talking about air emissions related to Fraxand mining. Then Mike Parson and Jay Zambito from Wisconsin Geological Natural History Survey will be talking about groundwater issues. And then finally, Dr. Steve Deller from UW Extension and the Department of, oh gosh, Ag Economics uh, will talk about the economic impact of frac sand mining. And then we'll wrap up. So... Just a little bit of background to, to start on this. This is a map of the bedrock uh, in Wisconsin. And I, when I go to the next slide, note the, the yellow. Um, so it's a particular form of bedrock which makes the, the sand here. And it closely matches. The red dots are frac sand mines from 2011. Uh, so you can see they're right within all of that particular area. All right, what is non-metallic mining? And Wisconsin has about 2,500 non-metallic mines. They exist in every single county. And it's the extraction of mineral aggregates or non-metallic minerals. So it can be stone, gravel, sand, uh, and it's for sale or use by an operator. And the, the photo just shows what one of those can look like. Uh, the process for sand mining in particular is this uh, series of uh, words here. Uh, so they remove the sand, they screen it, they wash it, they remove fines, which is the clay particles for the most part. Uh, the sand goes into drying uh, or a stockpile. They further screen into different grades, and the different grades go off to different uh, processes. And so a particular grade is for frac sand. It can also go uh, to a different place to be coated with a resin, and finally transported out, either through truck um, and then to a rail or oftentimes directly on rail. So very quick uh, on the process side here. Who regulates non-metallic mining? For the most part, local governments regulate it. They can regulate it through zoning. Uh, they can put conditional use requirements on it and operational requirements. And then through state statute, through NR 135, which are natural resources rules, uh, reclamation plans are required, and the county administrates that. At the state, DNR issues a number of permits. There's water, air, and then other regulations can come into play depending on the scale and what's happening at a non-metallic mine. <clears throat> 
So what we're going to be talking about today is what are the potential health risks. Uh, and you can see some of the dust uh, in the, the air there. So that's, that's um, one potential risk we'll be talking about. Air monitoring is another one. Um, so how does air monitoring happen and then what are the implications of that? What is the impact of groundwater? And lots of these have high capacity wells and there's usually a place uh, where after washing the water is settled out. And then finally, what is the impact of frac sand mining? In western Wisconsin uh, and southeastern Minnesota, this is particularly uh, an issue and there's all sorts of signs out uh, pro and uh, con for frac sand mining. All right, I am going to move right on to our next speaker and that is Dr. Crispin Pierce. And so I will hand it over to him. Great, thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate the chance to share what we've been doing. If you can see me in the um, little video clip, and I'm gonna hold up here two vials, one of natural sandstone and the other of refined frac sand. And the point of showing this is that it's these very small particles that represent the fines that were mentioned. You can see on one of our courts here that we're concerned about. Next slide. I'd like to introduce our partners, UW Stout, the Environmental Health Sciences Research Center at UW, excuse me, at University of Iowa, and then the RJ Lee Group is doing our filter analysis. Next slide. So we'll talk today about, I'll summarize the work we've done, how the particulates and silica get in the air. We'll talk about health risks, regulation, and then share some of the PM, particulate matter and silica data, and then conclude the work we've done. Next slide. So frac sand mining processing and transportation do increase fine dust particulate levels. Those are called PM 2.5. That includes crystalline silica. The particles we know from decades of research um, uh, in dirty cities and in occupational settings cause cardiovascular disease, lung disease, and lung cancer. Our measurements have found higher levels around sand plants compared to regional levels and oftentimes above the long-term EPA standard. Uh, we believe that monitoring of local PM 2.5 in silica is essential to protect public health. Next slide. Um, as of May 2014, there are about 142 frac sand facilities here in Wisconsin. So it's a burgeoning industry that uh, there are a number of concerns, particularly in local jurisdictions, about how to address these, how to address applications. Next slide. So how do particulates and silica get into the air during these sand operations? Next slide. Certainly through the um, particulate matters generated through blasting, loading, and hauling of these materials, processing activities such as crushing and transporting frac sand and what's called waste sand. These are the fine particulates that are not needed by the frac sand companies but are most concerned to us as public health professionals. Next slide. So here's an example of a, a surge pile is what it's called, <clears throat> excuse me, and there is blow off as we saw earlier in the slide from these kinds of large, uh, large exposed piles of sand. Next slide. And here's an example at a mining site again of these fine particulates blowing off of the uh, sandstone. Next slide. Here's an example up in Bridge Creek where there's a conveyor belt between the mine and the processing plant and it's about a mile long and you can see there's substantial leaking by the large piles of sand that have accumulated underneath the conveyor belt. Next slide. And certainly blasting. Again, in the Bridge Creek area, um, we see uh, many, many particulates, high concentrations of particulates released to the air during the blasting process. Next slide. Frac sand train derailment, although now these are the larger particles, they don't include as many of the fines as in the mining process. When we have spills like this, the public is also exposed. Next slide. DNR has cited a couple of violations, but this is really based upon citizen complaints. This is an example down in Patterson Mine where the truck to rail transport uh, was not well controlled. You can see fine particulate emissions. Next slide. 
So how long do these small fine particulates stay up in the air? Uh, between 10 and 15 days, larger particles thaw up more easily from gravity, smaller particles coagulate. Next slide. We'll talk now about health risks. Next slide. So there are a number of concerns uh, as, uh, as we look at it from a health professional point of view. We focused on airborne pollutants that was alluded to earlier. Waterborne pollutants are a potential issue. Noise pollution, light pollution can be factors for communities, wetland losses, truck traffic with road safety and greenhouse gas generation are all concerns. Our focus has been on the airborne pollutants. Next slide. Particulate matter we know from decades of research uh, in dirty cities, uh, respiratory symptoms such as irritation of the airways, coughing or difficulty breathing and asthma are a result of inhaling these fine particles. Also development of chronic bronchitis, irregular heartbeat, non-fatal heart attacks, premature death and lung cancer. Uh, if you can think of pictures of Beijing, for example, you can see that very, very dirty air and that's where we see these effects most acutely. Particle size is very important. The arrows point to, on the left side of the screen, to the larger particles, relatively sized, that fraxane companies want to create the, the breaking of the shale and keep the, the pores open to full recovery of gas and oil. The one particle sizes we're most concerned about are the PM2.5, which are represented in the lower corner in the clay sizes. Next slide. Crystalline silica is one of the components of actually all the particle sizes. Uh, when it gets down to small sizes, the respirable fraction down to PM4, um, it becomes really quite dangerous to workers we know and potentially to the public. So it's a particularly dangerous component of these fine particulates. Next slide. As we look at a visual representation of the different kinds of sand on the left, we have beach sand, much larger rounded particles. Well, we're concerned about the cementing particles, the much finer particles called respirable silica or quartz. And under a microscope, and we've seen this in our lab, uh, we see these more jagged pieces. So these are the smaller pieces that we're concerned about getting into the deep lung. Next slide. Silicosis is a result of inhaling these fine particles. It's, it's a fibrosis or scarring of the lungs. It's a progressive disease and leads to disability and death. Also associated with kidney and autoimmune diseases. Next slide. Silica is considered a lung cancer causing agent by many agencies, including International Agency for Research on Cancer, NIOSH, and OSHA. Next slide. And we see that Wisconsin is a state where we see higher levels of this traditionally in the workplace, higher levels of silicosis because of the quality of the sand and because of uh, manufacturing and sand using um, uh, occupations in Wisconsin. Next slide. So NIOSH, who studies and protects worker, workers, uh, reported 75 deaths in Wisconsin between 96 and 2005 from silicosis. Again, this is in the occupational sector, manufacturing, construction, and mining. Uh, they predict about 200 people in the United States will die this year due to workplace exposure to silica. Between 8 and 18 people are expected to die in Wisconsin from workplace silicosis based on these same numbers. Many of you have heard that the OSHA is considering a reduction, a halving of the exposure standard to protect workers. It's not under discussion. Next slide. So how, uh, how is uh, exposure from these fraxan particulates and silica regulated? Next slide. Six states, uh, but not Wisconsin, are regulating crystalline silica exposure. California has done, I think, a really nice job in carefully evaluating this risk, and they've set a standard to protect the public of three microgram per cubic meter of the fine particles, the respirable particles. Minnesota at the bottom recently also adopted the same standard. Uh, to protect people from exposure. Next slide. How does the DNR here in Wisconsin regulate? They use EPA air mod computer model actually to predict an increase in air level of pollutants. They take the amount of sand processed per day that the applicant is proposing. They have a unit emission rate, so for a, a certain volume of sand, there'll be a certain number of a volume of emissions. And then they also include pollution control equipment, for example, bag houses. PM10 monitoring is required, but often waived. Less than 10% of facilities in Wisconsin have been required to do monitoring. And fugitive dust control plan for emissions, that's what's used to look at uh, which are blowing off a sand pile, for example, or a roadway. It's not considered in the DNR air mod modeling. Next slide. So here's an example. We actually did this air mod. We worked with air mod as well. 
for the EOG facility in Chippewa Falls. The boxes represent sites we've sampled. The purple arrows actually represent the lineup of truck traffic, and the red circles represent sensitive receptors in the area, older folks, kids, etc. But from this modeling, we, we can see that the effect, at least the predicted effect, of particulates from this facility uh, has a radius of several kilometers. Next slide. And when DNR does the analysis, they predict levels that are going to be very close to the standard levels, the EPA standards. So if you look in that center column for PM 2.5, 24-hour, for one particular facility, uh, the background was 25. This facility is going to add 7, but that got up to a level of um, 33, which is very, very close to the standard. So it got up, in this case, to a 93% of the standard. That's why we're concerned about PM 2.5. Next slide. And WDNR even believes PM 2.5 standards are being seeded in some cases. Here's a quote from Jeff Johnson, a local DNR representative who does air quality regulation. Next slide. Yep. Uh, my critique of the DNR approach, they don't include fugitive dust emissions and the prediction of pollutant levels. They don't consider cumulative effects from nearby sources of pollutants. For example, is there another sand plant within this uh, radius that would also be contributing to the air quality uh, issues? They've declined to establish a limit for crystalline silica exposure, and they don't require monitoring of PM 2.5 or silica. Next slide. So how are we measuring these fine particulates? Next slide. So as we look at uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, they are now monitoring in, in many locations, 30 locations around the state, and recently put up a monitor on the top of the YMCA building in Winona. Uh, and, and that, that Instruments now monitoring emissions that include nine frac sand mining transporting processing sites, uh, and they had the poorest air quality in Minnesota today in 2014 based on the PM 2.5 levels, and we can see that in the next slide. On the far right, we can see that again the Winona site has had the poorest air quality, uh, likely due in part to the frac sand emissions, but also I have to say this is a hub, this is a transportation hub, so diesel emissions are going to be part of this, um, this poor air quality. Next slide. MSHA, Mine Safety and Health Administration, has done investigations, regular checkups on mining facilities here in Wisconsin. And in any, every case when they've looked, they've found respirable crystalline silica. And if you look down on the, the bottom two red indicators, there are times in which that respirable silica is higher than the occupational standard. Uh, standard much higher than the uh, public standard. Next slide. Work also done by NIOSH has found that even at the hydraulic fracturing sites, the sites where the frac sand, the processed frac sand is being used to uh, crack the foundation to extract oil and gas, that we have exposure to the workers in that location of the fine respirable particles. And next slide will show that. So in this case, in the top graph, we see that 47% of ex uh, exposures, of measurements by NIOSH, were above the OSHA permissible exposure level. Another 32 were above the NIOSH recommended exposure level, and just 21% were below this. So we're seeing silica on site at the hydraulic fracturing sites at levels that are above workplace standards, and so workers are at risk. Next slide. What about industry studies are certainly important to me as I look and compare our data as well as government data. Next slide. And Dr. Richards, I know, is going to speak to his work early. Um, I've appreciated being able to read it. And he has found from some initial studies that have not yet been published, but initial studies that have found the PM4, the respirable crystalline silica levels, to be quite low, below 1, well below 1. I mentioned the standard of 3 that California has set. So his contention, and I know he'll speak to this later, is that that's very similar to background levels in urban environments. Next slide. Industry data published by the DNR. DNR has recently put up this map. We can click on these locations to find out the data that have been reported at the, that location by industry. Next slide. And if we analyze this, uh, 909 PM10, the much larger particle samples, um, have an average of 13.8 which is well below the PM10 standard. When we look at our data comparing PM2.5, we assume we measured PM2.5 to 68% of PM10. The average across all these samples is 
compared to the standard of 12, and the average across all operations is 11.9, uh, again, compared to 12. This is why we are concerned that PM 2.5 should be measured, uh, because even with industry data, it appears to be very close to the limit. Next slide. Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has recently begun to publish their data as well. Well, I should say these are actually industry data presented or given to the NPCA. And we can see that the blue line that the numbers of PM10, uh, sorry, the PM2.5, they've compared it to a 24-hour worst-case scenario in the, the blue line. I think it's more appropriate to compare it to the yellow line. Um, so there is some concern, but you can see even pre and post at the bottom before the permit and after the permit of these industry data are claiming, and with, with pretty solid numbers it looks like, um, that there's been no increase. Next slide. So our research. Next slide. So we've been looking at local sand mining processing and transport sites. First in the Chippewa Valley, we've expanded since that time, collecting data on PM2.5 and PM10. We've taken both one to two minute snapshots and 24 hour filter collections. When we go out, and I want to thank all my students at the university here this, who've done a great job being out in the field with me, recording longitude and longitude, uh, relative humidity, wind direction, wind speed, and time. Next slide. We believe, uh, based upon research, that the PM 2.5 levels are the best indicator of public health risk. American Cancer Society, as well as studies from Harvard, have increased that these fine part particulates get deep into the lung and do cause increased risk of death, cardiopulmonary, part cardiovascular disease, and lung cancer. So these, we believe, are the best measure of potential public health risks. Next slide. Also, we believe the measurement enforcement of the current EPA-12 microgram per cubic meter PM 2.5 standard will protect also against silicosis risk. And this is based upon the MSHA inspections, which found about 15% of the fine particulates in silica. So we multiply the standard of 12 and think about 15% will be silica. We get to a level of 1.8, which is below the standard set by the state of California. So we believe that the current regulations by EPA are enforced people will be protected against silicosis as well. Next slide. Uh, we use the dust track aerosol monitor. This is a direct reading handheld instrument. Next slide. We've also used the next generation dust track 2. Works in a similar way but has greater data holding capacity as well as a built-in filter. Next slide. We use a DPS instrument, um, deployable sampler, uh, produced by SKC, tested by the U.S. Army to go out and collect 24-hour samples. This is a filter-based instrument that's not going to be affected by uh, humidity, for example. Next slide. And then recently we've been uh, very fortunate to partner with the University of Iowa. They've lent us two of these Anderson dichotomous samplers, which are EPA certified for doing this work. And we are now using those to measure PM2.5, 10, and silica. Next slide. This picture recently of my students up on the roof. The dichotomous sampler is on the right, the DPS is on the left, and again, this has been a great experience for my students to learn how to do this monitoring. Next slide. We've collected and analyzed the particle-based filters, and we've chosen a private industry partner, RJ Lee Group, has a great reputation, and so they are doing the analysis of our filters, including PM10, PM2.5, and silica. Next slide. So some of our uh, initial data here, that measuring at the EOG facility in Chippewa Falls on the left during construction we measured and all the way through to the right in full operation. And so we have seen as we've come back over the months and now years an increase in concentration in these snapshot measurements. Next slide. We also see that the degree of activity is going to make a big difference. Um, the blue plot is the DNR background level. The, the red plot are our measurements, our direct reading instrument measurements. And we can see at two different times with, very, with no activity versus full activity at the EOG facility, we saw some big increases uh, during activity, truck traffic, uh, movement of uh, trains, uh, processing the sand. Next slide. RPM chin levels were higher than DNR, so we actually measured out these when we go over to on the right side, the right triangle, the green triangles were higher than the red dot on the left, which is the predicted level the maximum predicted level, and then the EOG measurements were in the blue. So we want to continue to measure to find out 
what how we can reconcile these numbers. Next slide. In the number of facilities, again, the blue represents the DNR background regional measurements, the green represent our measurements, and in each case here, we saw an increase over the um, the background levels provided by DNR. And just for um, reference, the EPA annual PM 2.5 standard is in the red um, line there. Next slide. In our 24-hour filter-based sampling, uh, again, we've seen some pretty substantial levels. It does depend on wind speed and direction, amount of precipitation, degree of activity, but these I consider to be more reliable because they're not influenced by uh, precipitation, by humidity, and then they show some concerns. We do have a manuscript uh, being considered at the Journal of Environmental Health right now. Initial results have been positive. They'd like us to, to fill in more details, but we are publishing these data. Next slide. We've also done some initial Praxan train sampling near uh, trains that come through Eau Claire. Next slide. And we see that uh, in this initial sample that as a Praxan train came by, for at least several minutes there was a substantial elevation in PM 2.5, and you can see those levels got up to be about 45 microgram per cubic meter. When there was a non-Praxan train that came by several minutes later, there was no such elevation. So we're interested in measuring rail lines as well. Next slide. Yep, Crispin, you have two minutes. Thank you. All right. So how are we validating these data? Let's take a look. Next slide. Our numbers are pretty close to the measurements made by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Next slide. Similar here, so we're pretty close to what the agency is measuring. Next slide. Same thing with our 24-hour samples, pretty close to what MPCA is measuring. Next slide. And our inter-instrument testing, we have six instruments. We're looking to get all the dots right on that, that straight line, which represents pretty good correspondence. So we're making progress to having all the instruments or get the same numbers or understanding why. Next slide. So what are my conclusions? Next slide. PM 2.5 are the most concerned of public health. Measurement enforcement of the current EPA standard is likely to protect against silicosis risk. Next slide. Minnesota saw so average levels just below the PM 2.5 standard, but much higher levels in other locations like Winona. They found, MSHA has found exceedances of workplace standards, and NIOSH has found those as well in Proxam pro, uh, injection sites. Next slide. Industry measures have found PM 10 levels about 10% of the standard, and silica levels below the California standard. Next slide. Measure levels at the places we have seen were above the DNR background levels, 24-hour filters found the same thing, and we're doing inter-instrument comparisons right now. Next slide. Great. All right. Thank you, Crispin. You're welcome. So there are, let me see if I can expand my question piece here. Lots of questions, uh, but we only have time for, for one or two. So I think one of the, the big ones here is can you talk about um, sort of the, the statistics of this? You know, do, do you have enough samples uh, to really measure the statistics, that sort of thing? Yeah, it's a very valid question. Um, sampling has to be done very carefully. There are a lot of vicissitudes, things that change the quality and the quantity of the data. So I believe that we're kind of in mid-stride. Our initial direct reading instruments gave us some level of concern. We're getting to now EPA certified instruments, and it really is a longer term sampling, both to get a good idea of the long term exposure to people in the area, but also the risk. Because these levels of, of silica and particulates are not going to send people you know, running to the hospital, but they are potentially increasing long term risk. So it's a very good question. That's where, really where we're going next to, to sample on the order of six months to two years at different locations to collect enough data to have some uh, really sound conclusions. Okay. And then one more question for you. How do you deal with a place like Winona or central Wisconsin where it's, you know, lots of farming going on and, and maybe when it's blowing, you know, especially in a sandy region anyway, how do you get the, the farm sand, you know, What's the difference here between the farm sand and then the mine? 
it's really about particle size. Farm sand tends to be much larger. The respirable portions are much smaller than that. It's, it's the blasting, it's the extraction of the, the, and the processing of the sand from frac sands that creates a, a higher fraction of the PM2.5 we're most concerned about. The other issue is called freshly fractured silica. So that is when uh, within 24, 48 hours um, of digging this stuff out, it becomes, it's more dangerous than after that period. There are actually free radicals on the tips of these little small particles. So it's both the particle size, which are much larger in farming, and the freshly fractured nature of the, the process that blast the blasted in that are, are making a difference. Good. And then one last question for you. Is there any, and I'm going to read this question, is there any peer-reviewed literature which shows causation between environmental exposure or non-occupational exposure to respirable silica? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, it's, it's going to take us a while. The, the, uh, silicosis and lung cancer develop over the course of 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And so uh, any kinds of large exposure, large uh, potential exposures are going to take some time to, to appear. And it's also like kind of the question of secondhand smoke. It's going to be more difficult to tease out the risk to the public compared to miners or people using sand mm -hmm. in an occupational setting. Good. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Crispin, Crispin Pierce. Oh, sorry. Um, and here are all of his uh, ways to get in touch with him. And Crispin, I don't know if you can see all the quest questions, but they're probably useful as you keep going with these studies. I'd be pleased to answer any personal questions uh, in the future. Please send me an email. Here's my address and, or give me a call. I'm happy to talk with you. Great. Thank you. All right, so we are going to move on to our next speaker, and that is Dr. John Richards. And sorry, I said DNR, and it's not DNR. Um, no problem. Yeah, so I'll leave it to you to introduce yourself, and just remember to say next slide. I will do. Um, good morning. I'm John Richards. I'm with Air Control Techniques, which is a North Carolina-based engineering and testing company, and I appreciate this chance to present the ambient PM4 crystalline uh, data that we've been able to compile at four EOG facilities here during the last um, year and a half. Now, I'd like to note right at the beginning that a number of people have made very significant contributions to this study, and I'd like to recognize them early on. Todd Brazell of Air Control Techniques, for example, has helped design the sampling method we've used, has been very active compiling the um, very extensive quality assurance data, and as he's also done the quarterly audits. Brian Immelt and Chris Anderson served as contractors to EOG and operated the sampling network of eight primary samplers, four co-located samplers, and four MET stations. And we drew on the wealth of experience provided by Bob Glenn with respect to crystalline, uh, crystalline silica analyses. Uh, Wisconsin DNR personnel conducted field audits of the samplers, and we appreciated their effort. And I also want to thank EOG for their considerable support of this um, long-term sampling program. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is a road map of where I'm heading in the presentation. I'm going to very briefly describe my background and then go into a quick summary of the data we've compiled. I would like to spend just a minute or two on the ambient crystalline silica characteristics that factored into our design of the study. I'll provide an introduction to the EPA-based reference method sampling procedures we used and also the NIOSH um, analytical procedures used for the crystalline silica analysis. And again, for those that aren't familiar, NIOSH is the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And throughout this talk, I'll just uh, use uh, the term NIOSH to refer to them. A major part of the talk will focus on the summary of the very large data set we've been able to compile at the four facilities. I'll present some conclusions and um, i try to wrap up so there's some time for some questions at the end. Uh, next slide, please. As I promised, I'm going to make this brief on my background. I have 45 years of experience in the air quality field. I've worked primarily on diagnostic testing of air pollution control equipment, stack testing, emission factor testing, agency training, test method development, and of course, ambient air monitoring. I've been working on ambient crystalline silica sampling since 2006. Next slide, please. Okay, why measure PM4 ambient crystalline silica concentrations? And 
I think Wisconsin DNR got it right when they concluded in their 2011 silica paper that while there was no indications of issues in the broader areas of the state, there was relatively little data relevant to the localized concentrations of PM4 crystal and silica near possible sources. The limited data that were available involving localized concentrations were not necessarily representative of the conditions and weather conditions in Wisconsin. And obviously, no one wanted to wait a long time frame to determine whether or not there were some possible health issues. Accordingly, in 2012, EOG initiated this sampling program. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here's a quick summary of the data that I'll be discussing. It covers periods of 13 to 15 months at the four plants. There was actually about 136 to 153 sample days. And for considering the set of eight monitors in the network, we totaled out, at least for the period I'll be discussing, of over 1,000 sample days and 28,000 hours of sampling, so a quite extensive uh, database. Our average concentration of PM4 crystalline silica in that set of uh, over 1,000 days of sampling was um, 0.24 micrograms of PM4 crystalline silica per cubic meter, which is a very small concentration. And again, these samples were based on well-established EPA reference method samplers, which I'll discuss in just a minute. And the samples were quantified for crystalline silica using a well-established um, NIOSH method, the X-ray diffraction method. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the study had to take into account that crystalline silica is one of the most common minerals in the Earth's crust. It comprises, on average, about 12% of rock and soil. And anything that serves rock and soil at least has the potential to be a source of crystalline silica, although only a very small fraction of that will be in the respirable size range of PM4 and below, because crystalline silica is an especially hard material that does not easily break down into less than PM4 size range. In response to the presence of the numerous possible natural and community sources, we decided it was necessary to use two sampling sites at each of the facilities that we studied. One of these, of course, was to monitor the air quality leaving the facility. The other served to give us a measure of the background air quality of the air approaching the facility. So again, we could look at the contributions of the whole host of sources, not just the source that's in our uh, scope of our study. Uh, next slide, please. And here's a list of some of those sources. It's certainly not an inclusive list, but it gives us a good start. And if you go down that list of seven sources, it's pretty clear that all of these are going to be intermittent in nature. Most of them are going to be affected by weather. And there could be some seasonal variations in the crystalline silica emissions from these various uh, community and natural sources. So in response to that, we thought it would be especially important to sample, first of all, for 24 hours for each sample day, which, again, is standard EPA practice but also to operate the samples over a long period in at least 12 months so that we could take into account the seasonal factors and weather conditions that might influence the contributions of all the various sources. OK, next slide, please. Okay, I'd like to emphasize that crystalline silica is not a new issue. Industrial facilities, OSHA and MSHA, have been actively involved in minimizing employee exposure for many years, in fact, well over 30 years. And during this time, industrial hygienists and other health professionals have developed, I think, a considerable base of information on how to monitor for airborne crystalline silica. And we tried to the maximum extent possible to benefit from this wealth of experience in designing the study. I'd also like to note that ambient crystalline silica, which is really the focus of this particular talk, is also not a new issue. Regulatory agencies on a number of occasions have reviewed the available data, and I think the conclusion came back was consistently that compliance with the National Air Ambient Air Quality Standards for Particulate Matter and compliance with the state-imposed dust regulations, of which I think you've seen some in, in both of the initial talks, uh, provide protection from ambient crystalline silica. And the results of this sampling study strongly support the, those conclusions reached earlier by uh, those regulatory agencies. The only thing different is now we're able to provide considerable more data for those sort of analyses. Okay, let me go on to uh, next slide, please. And I'll start to focus on the EOG facilities. You see there's four separate uh, plants. The Chippewa Falls plant is a sand processing plant. The other three are mines. 
Uh, three are in Chippewa County, and one is further to the north in uh, Barron County. Next slide, please. Now, I'd like to spend a few minutes and discuss the sampling procedures we chose to, to use this. And really, this starts in 2006 when we developed a sampling method for PM4 crystalline silica in response to the publication of the California Office of Health Hazard Assessment. I'll use the word AHIA in the remainder of the talk. Their chronic reference level of 3 micrograms of PM4 crystalline silica per cubic meter, and you've already heard that um, reference level has been introduced earlier. So, Now, to make ambient measurements and make meaningful comparisons, we felt we'd have to be able to monitor crystalline silica in the ambient air down to about 10 percent of this OHIA uh, chronic reference level. And that takes us down to a level of 0.3 micrograms per cubic meter, which is an especially low level. And we obviously needed a sophisticated sampling system to do that. The instrument shown here on the left side of the slide had the capability to provide these very sensitive measurements of PM4 crystalline silica. And this is a Thermo Fisher Partisol 2000i PM2.5 sampler. It's an EPA reference method sampler, and it is used extensively in both EPA and state ambient air quality monitoring networks. We have simply adjusted the performance of this instrument for PM4 crystalline silica sampling by changing the flow rate. And by doing this, we increased the range of particulate matter that's captured during the sample period. Instead of just getting from 0 to 2.5 micrometers, we got 0 to 4 micrometers. So we took in a bigger bite of the ambient particulate. And we got to a PM4 size range, which was consistent with the industrial hygiene literature, again, which is where most of the health effects data, in fact, almost all the health effects data is centered. So it gave us the data in a form that we could directly compare back and also directly compare back to the OHIA uh, chronic reference level. We operate these samplers 24 hours a day from midnight to midnight every three days, and we operated the instruments entirely consistent with the standard EPA requirements in um, Part 50 Appendix L, but also the QA requirements published by EPA. We also sampled on the same days as EPA and the state do in all their networks throughout the country so that we'd have comparability of the data. Next slide, please. Of course, the instrument on the left gives me a PM4 particulate matter sample. I have to go one step further to get the crystalline silica value, and to do that, Instead of using the Teflon standard filter they use for 2.5 analysis, we had to shift to PVC because PVC is a specified material for NIOSH method 7500, the X-ray diffraction analysis technique. So with those two small changes, one to the sample flow rate, the other to the filter, the instruments that are used extensively already in many sampling networks have the um, ability now to do very sensitive measurements of ambient crystalline silica. Next slide, please. Okay, now we deployed these samplers in a upwind downwind configuration, and I'm going to use the Chippewa Falls plant as an example of how these were positioned, and actually the configuration was similar in all four. I'm showing an aerial diagram, and probably due to the scale that's on your screen, I'll have to label a few of these. There's a location shown in blue at the southern, near the southern fence line at the facility, would have one sampler there would have another sampler up at what's labeled location one, if you can see that on your screen. That's near the northern end of the property. And actually, that location one, coincidentally, is very close to that large storage pile that Dr. Pierce showed a little bit earlier. So we were right in the neighborhood of that, um, that large pile. There's a meteorological station right in the center of the facility that was at the 10-meter height, which, again, is something required by EPA uh, specifications. When the winds were from the south, southeast, or southwest, which was the most common wind direction for this, um, this area, the air would approach location two, would have one sampler there, would get an indication of the background air quality. The air would pass over the facility, then pass over our location one, where we had another primary sampler, and would get an indication of the contribution of the facility and also the air quality exiting out into the community area. So, it provides us with a way to look at, again, all these host of sources that can contribute, but then also break out separately the contribution of the facility that we're studying. I'd also like to remark at location one, the one that was generally the downwind site, we'd have a second monitor that would operate every 12th day, not every third day. And we used that monitor strictly for quality assurance purposes and 
the numbers I've been mentioning early on do not include those particular sample days because, again, that was strictly a quality assurance step. So there were three monitors at each site. Uh, would monitor the upwind and downwind conditions every third day, and um, as long as the wind directions behaved and they either came from the south or the north, we could uh, look at the upwind downwind difference. If the winds happened to come from the east or west, then both the locations would indicate background air quality and not necessarily the contributions of uh, the facility being tested. Can I have the next slide, please? This shows the results of the Chippewa Falls plant data, and since this is the first of four graphs, I think I'd like to define uh, the scales and how the slide is formatted. Uh, the vertical axis is the PM4 crystalline silica concentration in micrograms per cubic meter. That goes from 0 to 5. I've got two bars which show the location 1 and location 2 sites, and again the location 1 site was the northernmost position in the previous aerial. Location 2 was the southernmost site, but again, we would look at each individual wind um, weather data for each day to determine what was upwind and downwind. So uh, those are the two average concentrations for the entire set of data. There was 153 sample days at location 1, and actually I think there's a typo that's supposed to be 153 days also at location 2. So we had uh, a very large data set to work with. The average concentration at location 1 was 0.33 micrograms per cubic meter. The long-term average at location 2 was 0.22 milligrams per cubic meter. And both of these, um, these values are less than 10% of the OEA chronic reference level, which I'm showing off to the right to give some perspective on the data. And again, just uh, I guess in the, the most basic terms, we want to be below the OEA uh, reference exposure level, and we certainly are at both of these sites over the long time frame. And also I'd like to point out the maximum values we got on one given day at each site was about 1.44 micrograms per cubic meter, coincidentally the same value at both sites. Um, there is very little difference between uh, that and some of the other sites you'll see as I go further. And also that's very consistent with some of the maximum values we've seen in other areas and in other studies, so nothing surprising uh, in those particular values. I'd like to point you to the average, uh, the, the number of samples above the detection limit, and in the case of location one, only 31 of the samples uh, were above our detection limit. In location two, it was uh, even less, uh, only 13 percent um, were above the limit. Um, now, I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk a little bit about how we made those calculations so uh, that data will be clear as I get into some of the other slides. Um, the long-term average concentrations shown in those two bars for the EOG locations have been calculated using a relatively conventional procedure to address this large number of non-detection values. Since our limit of detection was 0.3 micrograms per cubic meter, we use a value of 0.15 micrograms per cubic meter, a value that is one half of our detection limit for all the samples that turned out to be below the detection limit. And just to take a short um, tangent and go into a brief um, uh, arithmetic exercise, um, if I had seven samples below the detection limit and three samples that happened to measure out at 0.45 micro, micrograms per cubic meter, the average concentration of that set of 10, 10 samples would be 0.24 micrograms per cubic meter. If I had a set of 10 samples and all of them were below the detection limit with this conservative approach, I'd get an average of 0.15 micrograms per cubic meter. So in effect, this approach to handling the large number of non-detection limits uh, generates a floor and the minimum number I could get is 0.15 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, I mentioned this primarily because in future analyses of the data, we might use a different approach for addressing these large number of below detection limit values uh, in the data set. However, I don't think this will have any impact on the conclusions we, we draw based on the data. Uh, next slide, please. All right, John, I'm going to move it forward, but you have about four minutes left. Four minutes, I'll make it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go through the next couple of slides pretty quickly, obviously with my four minute limit. Um, the DS slide, uh, again, was a operating uh, facility a little bit north. Uh, the concentrations of both location one and location two were very low, less than 10% of the um, OHIA, REL. Our maximum concentrations were slightly lower. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, SNS mine, again, you see the, basically the same data, um, same configuration of samplers. The concentrations, again, were all down well below 10% of the REL. Uh, can I have the next one, please? Uh, DD mine further north in Barron County. Um, again, we had our lowest numbers here. The averages at both locations were 0.2 micrograms per cubic meter. Again, well below um, the OHIA REL. And again, we have slightly fewer samples here because this mine started up in the middle of the sampling program. Let me go on to the next one. Next slide, please. And what we've done here is compare the upwind to downwind differences. Um, this happens to be for the Chippewa Falls plant. We have similar data for all the other plants. Uh, the slide on the vertical axis is the number of 24-hour samples um, in the categories that go uh, from uh, left to right on the horizontal axis. And the basic conclusion of this slide was there really is, in most of our sample days, no discernible difference from upwind to downwind. When there are differences, they tend to be small, and they can be both increased or decreased concentrations as we go upwind to downwind across the facility. Uh, we think there's two reasons for these, uh, this pattern. One, we're down at the precision limits inherent involving the comparison of data from two samplers at, that happen to be both at very low concentrations. And I think there's also some spatial variations in the background air quality, and we, we know that or can uh, certainly suspect that based on the fact that we have eight samplers in widely geographically separated areas, and they all seem to go up and down slightly each of the sample days. So we see a certain um, correspondence between those network monitors that indicates that there's a regional issue that's primarily responsible, and there's probably even small localized spatial differences. Next slide, please. We can see some indication of those day-to-day -day differences. This is 2.5 data from the uh, DNR Eau Claire site, and I've matched on that graph the PM4 particulate matter data from Chippewa Falls, which is located about nine miles away. You can see those sharp differences due to changes in air quality, which are both weather dependent and um, a track of air mass dependent variations. We also see good correspondence between our PM4 particulate matter data and the uh, Wisconsin DNR 2.5 data. So that brings me to my conclusions. Uh, next slide, please. We've got, I think, a very large data set, uh, more than 1,000 days, 150-some separate sampling days. Our concentrations of PM4 crystal and silica, uh, our long-term average concentrations were consistently thus in 10% of the California reference exposure level. Even our maximum values were well below uh, that level. The upwind to downwind fence line concentrations were very small. Uh, in fact, we thought um, it, it appears to us that background uh, spatial variations are going to be a factor that explains most of that variability. And um, with that, I think I'm finished, and I'll be glad to address any questions. Great. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Um, let's see, a couple questions for you. One is, are there any other sand mining facilities that have conducted similar studies to this one? Uh, yes, there have. Okay, and can you share them somehow? How would we find those? Um, actually, those studies um, start a little later. They're wrapping up a little later, but in the very near future, there's going to be papers written that summarize all that data also. And um, again, I think that, that data is very similar to um, what I've discussed today. Okay, and here's another question for you. Can you explain the chronic reference level and then compare that to, for example, a resident who would live proximal to a sand mine? Sure. I'll take a crack at that, and I'm probably going to refer back to the OHIA definition of um, chronic reference level, and it's, it's basically uh, an airborne level um, or concentration at which no adverse health effects are anticipated in individuals indefinitely exposed to that level. So. It's based on solely on health effect or health data, and it's um, basically, as I said in the talk, the, the level would like to stay below. Okay. Um, let's see. What else? Oh, how do you, um, I, and I think Crispin got something like this. And where is that? Uh, you know, the difference between the, the background and the frac sand. So how sure. do you, you know, if there, there's wood smoke in the sure. air versus the sand mine? Um, actually, we think there's a lot of natural and community sources that contribute small amounts, but maybe no one is significant or even the combination of all of them don't seem to be rising above 
uh, the levels that are anywhere approaching the OEA level. And to determine that, of course, our upwind downwind sampling procedure was, was well suited for that. We could look at ambient air as was approaching the facility we're looking at that might be coming from agricultural areas or unpaved roads or what have you. And we can then look at the downwind concentration and we can compare those over many days so we don't just get a snapshot but we see a whole uh, year's worth of data. And from that we get an idea of the background levels and I think as, as these data are compiled we're, we're going to have a much better quantification of the, the various sources and I think again I'm going to come to the conclusion there's a there's a lot of individual sources of entirely different types, but the cumulative contribution is fairly small. Because again, PM4 is a, a hard material that doesn't break down easily. And then one final question for you. I, how do seasons affect the sample? So, you know, winter In versus uh, spring where it might be windier? Uh, it's easy. It, it's really hard on the guy running the sampler, but in terms of the the unit itself and the data, it has no impact whatsoever uh, on the quality of the data. Okay. And then, how did you decide to use the California reference exposure level? Uh, good question. Right now, that one's um, published in 2005, and there really have not been many other attempts. Uh, to publish a guideline. At the time that was published, there were no ambient data to speak of in the PM4 size range. In fact, it was, it was a fairly limited data set. Um, so that was, uh, I guess, the most commonly used guideline, and that's why we've chosen it here um, uh, for this particular talk. Great. Well, thank you so much. Great. Thank and you. And at the beginning of this, did you have uh, ways for people to get in touch with you at all? I should have put that on the slide. Um, uh, can I make that available to you later so if people have uh, questions, they can email me? Sure. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next speaker, or speakers, is Mike Parson and Jay Zambito. They are both from the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. Are you guys on and ready to go? We're both here. Can you hear us? Yes. All right, and uh, well, thanks again, we, Jay and I. My name is Mike Parson. I'm a hydrogeologist at the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. I'm sitting next to Jay Zambito, who will be sharing a little bit more information later in the talk. Um, there's sort of two topics we wanted to hit on, and initially, I think just to, to thank the um, AIPG group, and when we were contacted, trying to think of some interesting topics that we could share about the work that we've been doing. Myself, I've been kind of heading up a study in western Chippewa County looking at impacts of both industrial sand mining and irrigated agriculture on the hydrogeology. And Jay is going to be sharing some information related to bedrock geology of the state. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, so this is just a, oh, back up one, sorry. So this is just an outline, a rough outline of what we're going to be presenting in our time slot. We're going to start off with an overview of essentially who we are as an agency and the type of work that we do across the state. I will then be digging down into the, the Chippewa County groundwater study in more detail. Jay Zambito will then be presenting information about the bedrock geology capabilities here at the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. When you see that acronym WGNHS, that's what that stands for. And then we'll wrap up with a few different online resources we have available, as well as field a few questions. Next slide. So as an agency, we are part of the University of Wisconsin Extension. And we are headed by the state geologist, whose name is Jamie Robertson. There are a number of faculty members and academic and other staff members within our office based out of Madison in south central Wisconsin. And we're divided essentially into three program areas. It's a multidisciplinary approach to get at both issues related to bedrock geology, hydrogeology, and quaternary geology. And we oftentimes collaborate on different projects as needed to address many of those overlapping areas. Next slide. We thought it was also important to just express the fact that as part of the University of Wisconsin Extension, our role as a research entity is essentially to extend the boundaries of the university to the boundaries of the state. And we do that by sort of interpreting our mission statement as the geological survey 
could be providing objective scientific information about the geology, mineral resources, and water resources, soil, and biology of Wisconsin. And the reason we're doing this is because these activities support informed decision making by a variety of different users, from the government to industry, business, and individual citizens. So we really see our role as an outreach um, and research wing of the state of Wisconsin. Next slide. So to dig down into the Chippewa County study, you can sort of see from the red box on the state of Wisconsin that the study area is located essentially in western Chippewa County. This is a five-year study. We're now about two years into it. We began in the fall of 2012. The study was commissioned initially by the Chippewa County Land Conservation Department, and we're working with collaborators at the federal level from the U.S. Geological Survey, who are sort of our, our research partners on this work. And due to the, the contentious nature of this issue and the attention being paid across the state and within this region in particular to industrial sand mining and water resources and agricultural impacts, there was a need that we, we felt to establish a stakeholders group quite early on in the study that would help provide feedback to the work that we're doing and the conclusions that we're finding as we go, and also a way to connect with a number of different groups and their interests within the region. So those, again, include local citizens, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the Wisconsin Farmers Union, Trout Unlimited, and actually all industrial sand mining companies within the study area. Next slide. So the objectives of the, the hydrogeologic study are essentially threefold. The first and the core focus of the study is to develop a groundwater flow model. We're well on our way to doing that, and over the past couple of years we've been collecting a lot of data to be building the groundwater modeling layers through which the water is sort of flowing in, our, in the model space. And this is going to be helping us to evaluate current and future water use within the area as well as changes to the landscape and those are primarily coming from changes due to mining sand at an industrial scale on the landscape and how those changes may impact the hydrologic system. Secondly, one of the major objectives is outreach. So that's why we've engaged the stakeholders group and are working with the public to present findings on an annual basis. Um, and we're also always available for questions about the work that we're doing. And finally, transferability was also an important part of the project where we're trying to kind of distill down some of the findings as we go and provide lessons learned for other areas that might be experiencing similar types of activity and looking at similar types of hydrologic impacts. Next slide. So why do we care? Well, it's important to sort of back up and think about what are some of the main reasons the study got kicked off and some of the main concerns in the area. And many of them have to do with pumping of groundwater in many of these upland areas near headwater streams that are important for fish habitat, trout habitat, and other um, biological habitat. There's also a concern of the impacts of intensifying water use practices on the landscape, not just from industrial sand mining, but also from irrigated agriculture. And in the photo you can sort of see below in this panoramic, you can see a couple trenches that are being out outfitted with piping, which is going from the well. We're essentially standing at the well and looking out into the distance. You can, if you kind of squint, make out a couple center pivot irrigation systems that are being tied in. And again, this is in this upland area, and some of the hills that you can see to the, both the left and the right are areas that could, in fact, be targeted for industrial sand mining. So there are a number of water users on the landscape. There's also important changes to the landscape um, and some of the implications that that could have for recharge to the groundwater system, as well as long-term water resource management and sustainability factors. Next slide. So the core of what I'm going to be essentially presenting in terms of our, our findings with this study involve some of the data that we've collected using geophysical logging. And this data set is very important because it provides very high um, resolution information about both the geology and the hydrogeology with depth within wells. And that, in turn, allows us to provide a more detailed hydrogeological characterization for model building. 
in the photo at the sort of the top left of the screen, you can see our geophysical logging van. There's someone actually sitting in the back with a hard hat on, and the there's a wire coming out to a pulley that's attached to this tripod, and that is lowering and raising different tools up and down in a well. And many times these wells go down several hundred feet within the study area. And we focused on three main wells within the study area that we'll be looking at in more detail. Next slide. So this is essentially a slide looking at what some of the data looks like. On the right, there's our logging van sitting at land surface with the instrumentation, those tools ready to be dropped down into the well. And Anne, if you could just click your clicker one time, you can essentially see how this tool is lowered down the hole. And it can take up to you know, half an hour to 45 minutes to lower a tool from the surface down to the bottom of that hole. As that tool is traveling from the surface to the bottom, it is collecting different types of data about both the rock and the, the groundwater system. And to sort of get ourselves situated on the figure on the left, this is what a finished geophysical log would look like. The top of this graphic is essentially land surface elevation, and you can see the elevation above mean sea level along the left vertical axis. So we're starting out around 1,080 feet above mean sea level. One of the next, the next um, vertical column, which is our gamma log and resistivity log, that's providing information about where some of the clay lithologies are more present, so where we see more of the the spikes in the gamma log to the right, where it's a wider section of red, that's where we're anticipating to have more clay content in the rock. And the areas that are a lower gamma signal, where it's thinner, that's giving us an indication that it's most likely more of a sandstone type of material. And there are a number of different logs. I'm not going to get into too much detail. And if you can just click one more time, Anna, you can see that we're raising the tool up and down, and with each pass, we're collecting additional information, filling out each successive column across that geophysical log. Next slide, please. So this is giving us some information, essentially the same log, but now looking with the video logger down that borehole. So again, we're basically just lowering a video camera pointed downwards into the well, going straight down the well. Just click on the slide one time. And so here's a look at that area where we have the elevated gamma signal, which we would anticipate to be representative of a higher clay-rich zone within the bedrock. And sure enough, when we look at that image with the video logger, and now we've essentially turned that video camera horizontally. So we're going down, looking down the hole, and as we go, we can turn it horizontally and spin it around and look at the rock itself. And indeed, we see a lot of shaley, um, interbedded areas within the rock at this point. Click one time. Here's another spot where there is much less of a gamma signal. And indeed, you can see that the video image shows that this is more of a, a coarse to medium grain sandstone. You can even see some cross bedding in that sandstone. Again, this is looking horizontally at the wall of the hole. And this is the type of information that is allowing us to then build up a better understanding of features within the ground that are potentially more conducive to water flow, such as in a sandstone, or areas that are less conducive to water flow, such as in the clay, clay areas. And this is helping to delineate what we refer to as an aquifer or an aquitard, and that in turn impacts the model building process. I think I have one more photo on here. If you could click one time, just to look at the bottom again, to at some of these clay layers, you can see those clay-rich kind of blue-gray, bluish-gray bands. Those are these clay-rich layers at depth in the well. Next slide. So if we stack three of these different geophysical logs next to one another side by side, they're not oriented necessarily with respect to the land surface. And if you click this one time, We're now going to hang them all to the same elevation above mean sea level. If you follow the line of 1060 elevation across, you can see those should all line up. And if you click one time, 
there's a few animations here, you can begin to see we're making some interpretations regarding the hydrogeology and the lithology that we feel is important for how groundwater flows through the system. And this line is essentially showing the bottom of this clay-rich horizon, which is probably close to 100 feet thick in the upper part of the borehole. Click one more time. Here you can see we're now at the bottom of the sandier interval, which we would expect to be behaving more like an aquifer, where we have higher flow through the rock system. Click one more time. This is essentially identifying a highly shaly rich area with a lot of interbedded shales that kind of go back and forth between sandstone, siltstone, and claystone or mudstone within the rock. And we're sort of identifying this as a potential aquitard that is um, uh, reducing flow through the rock. Click again. You can click one more time, Anna. So again, this is just the base of another more sandy interval that may, in fact, um, provide more of a conduit for water flow. And if you can click one more time on this slide, this will show us the bottom of this borehole, which is bounded by a Precambrian crystalline rock, which for the purposes of building a groundwater flow model, essentially behaves as a no-flow boundary to flow. So that's our lower limit for the flow model. So the next slide. And can you quickly explain geolog and HGU? Oh, sure. Yeah, I didn't want to necessarily get into too much detail on those logs. But the geologic log is essentially what a geologist would sort of loosely describe going down through the, the cuttings that are being collected from these wells. So as the well is drilled, and I should have explained this, cuttings from the hole are being brought back to the surface from the drilling operation. And we're oftentimes collecting those, or we receive those from different agencies that are drilling these wells. And we have geologists go through and describe the different materials in that. And in HGU, that's our hydrogeologic unit. So those are essentially the units that are lining up to those dashed lines across the page which is essentially our interpretation of where the different hydrogeologically important units are at depth. Okay. So there, there's a lot of information on, on each of those slides, but this is just, again, give people a flavor for some of these geophysical logs and the data that we're collecting. So here we're superimposing some of the names. And for those not familiar with the Wisconsin geology quite as well, some of these names might be new. But in this part of the state, the Wanawak, Sandstone, the Wanawak Formation, is the bulk of what is being mined at many of these sites, including the EOG mines that were presented in the, the previous um, talk. At depth, once you get below the water table, you tend to get into this Eau Claire Formation, which we've sort of interpreted to be a certain thickness for the modeling purposes. And then finally, with depth, something that is referred to as the Mount Simon Formation, we've subdivided into several different layers based on the shale content of that material within these geophysical logs. And that's where those symbols are on the right-hand side of the page. Next slide. And you guys have about five more minutes. OK, we should be all right. So this is just a quick slide here showing how this would look on the landscape. Um, I'm going to sort of breeze through this a little bit, but you can essentially see how we're comparing a hydrostratigraphic framework that we're making to the commonly recognized stratigraphic framework within the area and how these different units line up. Click one time. So next we're drawing a cross section across this area of the site and click again. And I think just one last time. And you can see this is what this would look like in cross section where we have these different units essentially horizontally across the study area. Click one more time. So very quickly about water use, um, this is showing some of the information about how water use has intensified on the landscape over the past decades. Next slide. 
And this is a map from the DNR showing how water use in Wisconsin um, is distributed from different sectors. You click again. And some of the key ones within Chippewa County are agriculture, municipal supply, and non-metallic mining. Next slide. And again, I'm going to go through this here pretty quick, but we can essentially see that some of the main factors are that although there are a lot of these different wells at these different types of site, sites, whether, whether it's industrial sand mining, municipal supply, or irrigated ag, the depths are roughly the same. The pumping rates are within the same order of magnitude. Agriculture is probably pumping a little bit less annually. But the number of wells is far more at many of these agricultural sites. However, they're also pumping fewer months out of the year. So all these variables are at play when it comes to thinking about water use and building a flow model. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jay to quickly give an overview of some of the bedrock work. So one of the products we produce at the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey are bedrock maps. And this figure here just shows the distribution of our different maps at different scales. On the left are our regional scale maps. Uh, you can see most of the mapping that's been done in the state at the regional scale is in the western and northwestern part of the state. And on the right is the distribution and status of our county scale geologic maps, which were primarily focused on the eastern and central part of the state and some of the more heavily populate, populated areas. Next slide, please. This is a map of west central Wisconsin done at the regional scale. The dark red color, uh, highly dissected, um, feature is the Wanawak sandstone, the primary target for industrial and, and frac sand mining. Um, although a map like this is inadequate for site-specific evaluation, it does provide a good first pass on, the, pass on the distribution of different rocks and therefore natural resources in different parts of the state. Next slide, please. Because much of uh, Wisconsin's bedrock is covered by either glacial sediment and or vegetation, the majority of our information on the bedrock geology comes from wells that are drilled for water or drill core that's collected to, um, to collect um, representative samples from below Earth's surface. And on the bottom right, that's just a figure to show the distribution of the drill core that the Wisconsin Geological Survey has. Um, the majority of that comes from areas where there's been metallic mining exploration. Um, on the two other pictures on the bottom, one is our drill rig on the left, and in the center, that's a picture of some of our core holdings. The Wisconsin Geological Survey not only collects drill core, but we house it, and uh, after we're done studying it for um, an immediate need, we hold on to it, um, so then when future needs arise, we have material um, representative uh, of the, the question at hand. And at the top is an example of some of our drill core. Um, the top of the core is in the upper right, the bottom is on the, the bottom left, and uh, what units you're looking at here are the Tunnel City on the right and the Elk Mound on the left. The Wanawak is the upper part of the Elk Mound, and uh, as I had mentioned, it's a primary target for industrial sand mining, and you can see one of the features of it on the left is that it's, it's falling apart. It's uh, not cemented very well, and that makes it um, an easily mineable natural resource. Next slide, please. So let's quickly go over uh, some of the different types of data we collect on drill core. On the left, this is the elemental profile we created using a handheld uh, XRF analyzer. And some of the elements that I'm showing here um, through this core uh, are relevant to industrial sand mining. So the light blue, that's calcium. That would be a proxy for carbonate cement. So this would be the cement that's holding the sand grains together if carbonate cement was present. Um, and on the, the gold color, that's silicon, um, increasing in abundance from left to right. And one of the things you can see about the Elk Mound group, and in particular the upper part, the Wanawak formation, is that it's real, relatively uniform in composition. Uh, there's practically no carbonate present um, based on using calcium as a proxy. Um, and you can see that it's relatively uniform in silicon, and that would be a proxy for the mineral quartz, which is a preferred material for industrial sand. The two elements shown on the, uh, sorry, on the right are potassium and aluminum, and those are proxies for clay content. Clay would be a material that would need to be washed away in the process of, um, of refining the sand for industrial use. 
Um, and one of the things I'd just like to point out here is the Elk Mound group, the Wanawak, um, is relatively uniform throughout. It's primarily quartz and there's a low clay content. In the upper right is a picture of some of the sand grains from the Wanawak. You can see that the grains are well-rounded. They're very spherical. Um, they're primarily quartz. It's a frosty or milky uh, white color. And they have relatively uniform grain sizes, which is one of the things that's necessary for using sand for industrial purposes. On the right in the middle is a reconstruction of the depositional environments when the sand was deposited approximately 500 million years ago. Uh, Wisconsin was uh, closer to the equator at the time due to plate tectonics. And the depositional environment um, spanned shallow marine beaches to uh, dunes and deserts. And both of these depositional environments rework grains. They cause them to become well-rounded. Uh, they sort the grain size. Um, and they also make the um, material mineralogically mature, meaning that you're primarily left with quartz uh, at the end of, of the process of deposition. And so it's the geologic history of Wisconsin um, has created uh, widespread sand deposits across Wisconsin that are suitable for industrial sand purposes. Next slide, please. Um, I hope, are you guys about done? We Is are, yeah. Okay. So I, just, so I just want to point out um, our website, wisconsingeologicalsurvey.org, where we have a number of publications and other resources um, related to frac sand mining. We have a frac sand fact sheet. We have an uh, industrial sand potential uh, map of Wisconsin, uh, as well as a, 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 a brief brochure um, that talks about the Chippewa County groundwater study that Mike covered earlier. Thank you. Great. Let's see. I think we have two quick um, slides there just showing data. So this is essentially for reference purposes, looking at some of the material that we've covered in the talk. And then the final slide is just a, a thank you and questions slide, which I think we've exhausted our time, but we thank everyone for their attention. Yeah, thank you, both of you. And one question for you. What might be the cumulative effects of all of the high capacity wells? Is that what, in part what you're measuring? It, it exactly is. That's one of the, the key questions that we have as hydrogeologists is putting everything on, on the table, looking at what impacts are, and to essentially take a holistic look at impacts, you need to consider all wells that are pumping on the landscape. So that will certainly be part of the modeling effort, will be to locate and quantify the amount of pumping at each well location and essentially hardwire that into the modeling so that we're looking at current or future scenarios we're including all wells that are pumping on the landscape. So there certainly may be instances where there are cumulative impacts and the fact of having multiple wells in close proximity could simply increase drawdown of the, the water table and um, the water elevations. Good. And do you know, have, have the number of high volume well permits risen? Uh, and who is applying for them? Is it ag? Is it frac sand? Is it? You know? It's a good question. If I wasn't able that one slide, if folks remember back where we had sort of a 1980 snapshot and a 2014 right. snapshot, I believe, you can see that there was an expansion of wells in upland areas. Now, historically, there was a lot of wells in lower-lying areas where it's shallower to the water table, and you're drilling into a sand and gravel shallow aquifer system, which has plentiful water um, for historically agricultural purposes in this area within western Wisconsin. And in the past several years, there's been more and more um, wells being cited for industrial sand mining, for washing and processing the sand. But we also have seen an uptick in high capacity wells for irrigation. So, you know, the, the largest number of wells in the study area is indeed agriculture. But, you know, there's a concern, I think, in general from folks of just a lot more wells in general. And we're trying to take that into account with the study. Well, good. Thank you so much. All right. We are on to our next speaker. And that is. Uh, Dr. Steve Deller from the Department of Ag and Applied Economics and he's going to be talking about economic impacts of mining. So Steve, are you on? Uh, yes, can you hear me okay? 
you're going to have to. Can you hear me okay? Uh oh. Um, I'm presuming that you can hear me. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different than the other three presentations. Um, I, what I'm going to what I'm going to try to do is to give a kind of a backdrop of what our current kind of thinking of how non-metallic mining relates to uh, rural community development, particularly rural, because most of the sand mines that are in Wisconsin are located in more rural areas. So what we're going to do is talk about three things. Next, please. Uh, we're going to focus on Wisconsin. What's exactly happening in Wisconsin from an economic perspective? What can we learn from a national perspective? And then the third is what are some community policy insights? What can communities do related to uh, uh, frac sand mining? Next, please. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to realize in Wisconsin is that the number of uh, firms in Wisconsin that have been involved in construction sand and gravel mining has been, um, this has been an industry that's been in Wisconsin for a fairly long time. You can also see what this is, is the number of firms in Wisconsin that have identified themselves as basically non-metallic mining companies. You can also see that most of these firms are actually fairly small, uh, less than 10 employees. Uh, but you'll notice that in 2012, there's actually a little uptick in the number of bigger uh, mining companies. So this is, you know, the point here is that there's, there's, this has been an industry that's been around in Wisconsin for a long time, uh, primarily feeding into the construction industry and also into some uh, manufacturing processes that are uh, present in the state. A lot of these firms tend to also be fairly small. Next slide. Now, this is uh, kind of the, uh, you know, the size of these firms is the number of mine firms uh, specific. Uh, and you can see that in uh, 2012, there was actually a fairly large jump in the number of firms that identified themselves specifically as sand mining. Uh, this would be different than a, a, a gravel uh, pit. These firms tend to be a little bit bigger, but notice there's really not that many of them. I mean, in 2012, there were only 14 identified in Wisconsin uh, as in this particular industry. Next slide. Now, this is a map that uh, others have seen, but what I want to kind of point out here is that there's a lot of mines that have been proposed. Uh, they're in development. Uh, but over the past year or so, there's really been a slowdown in the number of new mines that are opening. Uh, some of this is because of moratoriums that some communities have put in place, but it's also because of a reaction to the supply of sand. Um, because sand mining became so profitable so quickly, there's a very strong market reaction. There was almost a gold rush mentality that was going on a few years ago. And because of that sudden spike in the number of operations, that we're feeding into the sand mine, uh, the price of sand has come down. Uh, the demand has, uh, has kind of stabilized a little bit. So a lot of that gold rush mentality that we were experiencing a few years ago is actually starting to slow down a little bit. Next slide. Now, one of the problems that we've got when we do economic impact assessment here is that while it appears as though there's not very many firms, one company can own more than one mine. Essentially what we have is that we have a couple of mining companies that are actually operating several different mines. The other problem with the assessing economic impact is that not all of these companies are located in Wisconsin. The, the bar charts that I showed before, those are Wisconsin-specific firms. Next slide. But what we'll see actually is that there's a number of companies that are operating mines in Wisconsin that are not Wisconsin companies, for example. Fair Mount Minerals is out of Ohio. They're operating five mines. Superior Silica Sands out of Texas is operating four. Uh, ELG Resources out of Texas is operating four. Uh, so a lot of the mines that are operating are actually being operated by one company or a handful of companies, and a lot of those companies are located outside of Wisconsin. That's important when we do economic impact assessment. Next slide. The current price per ton of frac sand mine is about $110 per ton. Uh, 
about forty dollars of that is pure profit. Now, if these were local Wisconsin companies that were doing this, that forty dollars in profit would stay in the Wisconsin economy. The problem though is that because so many of these mining companies are actually located out of the state of Wisconsin, forty dollars of that or that pure profit of forty dollars per ton is actually leaving the state. So that greatly reduces the economic impact of these operations in the state of Wisconsin. So we have to worry about the ownership structure of these firms. Next slide. Okay. So the difficulty is how much of that profit is leaving Wisconsin. Next slide. Okay. Uh, the Wisconsin Economic Development uh, Corporation estimates that for every 10 jobs per fracked sand mines, there are 50 to 80 jobs for, uh, for every processing facility or com combined operation. So you got the fracked sand mine itself, and then you got the processing facility. Okay? Uh, Wisconsin Watch essentially said, if we go a little bit conservative on this, essentially what we're seeing is that there's about 2,780 people employed in the fracked sand mining industry in the state of Wisconsin. So we know that there's that many jobs, or about that many jobs, but we don't know essentially is where all the profits are going to. That's a big question mark. We do not have a good handle on that. Next slide. Okay. Now, if we do an economic impact of say, let's just look at the jobs. Okay. Say that we take that 2,780 jobs and we essentially say, how much does that contribute to the state's economy? What we find here is that once you apply the multiplier effect. There's about 5,500 jobs that are being created. So for every job in frac sand mining in Wisconsin, there's about another job that's being created. So a multiplier of 1.976. It's about two. Look at labor income. That's wages and salaries and proprietor income. For every dollar that is earned in income in that sense, there's another 60 cents, 61 cents generated elsewhere in the economy. Uh, we can see for total income, it's about uh, 56 cents, 57 cents, uh, additional multiplier effect. And then for industry sales, it's about 65 cents for every dollar of sales. Um, so the point here is that the, there, there's about 5,500 jobs here. There's about $600 million in total income being generated here. But the point that I want you to walk away with here is look at the size of the multipliers. Okay? One of the things that's being um, um, talked about in a lot of communities is the size of the economic multiplier. I've been in numerous community meetings where people have essentially said, well, everyone knows that for every job in, in sand mining, there's an additional eight jobs generated elsewhere in the economy. That's a multiplier of eight. That is incorrect. The multiplier is really more like 1.9 uh, or even a little bit smaller than that as you get into more remote, more, more, more rural communities. So be careful if anyone Anyone who says that the multiplier is really bigger than two, because it's not. Next slide. Uh, there's also some uh, some tax revenues that are generated here. Um, you can see that there's about a hundred and about thirteen million dollars in property taxes being generated. There's also uh, sales taxes that are being generated, and other types of taxes that are funded by the state government and through local governments. Next slide. Uh, what I'm going to share with you now is some work that I've been doing uh, looking more from a national perspective. This is a series of fact sheets and working papers that we've put together looking at uh, the frac sand mining industry. If you want copies of these, all you need to do is Google uh, Buffalo County uh, UWEX or University of Wisconsin Extension uh, frac sand, uh, and that will take you to all of these studies. What we're going to look here at from a national perspective is to look at how non-metallic mining impacts uh, communities across the U.S. Okay? What we're using here to look at the size of the mining industry is mining employment per population. Okay? So the higher the, this ratio is, the more uh, dependent, you could say, that the local community is upon mining. And you can see some spots here. You can see the coal mining area of the Appalachia. You can also see the Western Mountain uh, uh, or the Rocky Mountains in the Tennessee. You can also see in the upper northern part of the, uh, of the upper Midwest some activity. Next, next slide, please. Okay. 
what this is is essentially looking at whether or not that pattern that was in the previous slide is what's called statistically significant. And what we can see here are these red spots. These red spots are where you actually have high concentrations of activity. You see the coal mining industry in the Appalachia. Actually, there's a little bit of coal mining in southern Illinois. Uh, and then you see the mining activities in the western states. Uh, so that's the kind of where those hot spots are. So what we want to do is we want to look at what are the characteristics of those communities that have more mining activity. Next slide. Okay, so what we're going to do this is that we're going to do some simple correlation analysis. We want to use that employment to population ratio as one of variable, that would be variable one, and then variable two would be a range of different types of social community characteristics, things like population, health level. Let's just see what the data wants to tell us. Next slide. Okay. Um, what we did is some simple correlation analysis, and you can see some of the different variables that we're looking at here. Things like poverty rates, children in poverty, income inequality, uh, unemployment rate. Uh, please come. Okay, let me walk through what some of the summaries are. One is higher levels of mining is associated with lower poverty. Lower levels of income inequality. Next slide. Very nice. Higher rates of unemployment. Now what that's essentially saying is that these mining activities tend to attract people looking for employment. Unfortunately, not all of these folks are, are able to get, to get jobs. So what you'll see is actually higher rates of unemployment in some of these mining communities. You'll also see a problem with higher levels of instability within the industry. That is something that is a real uh, issue with mining. It's what's called the flickering effect. Is that these mines will not open and close per se, but what they'll do is they'll gear up and then they'll slow back. They'll gear up and they'll slow back. What that does is create instability in the local community and can create periods of unemployment. Next slide. Uh, there is higher property crime associated with uh, these types of uh, operations. Next slide. Uh, there's a higher share of people with a high school degree. That's good because a lot of these mining companies require a high school degree. Uh, you know, or a GED equivalent. Uh, they, they, that's a requirement for getting a job over on these operations. Next slide. The problem though is that it doesn't require a college degree. Most of these operations are fairly low skill type operations. Yes, I need a high school diploma to get the job, but I don't need any kind of advanced degree to operate these types of mines. There are some engineering based jobs that require higher skills, but your typical worker here is not a high school job. So what we've got here is that we can conclude is that these are indeed fairly good paying jobs. There are lower levels of poverty. Uh, but the question is, is that whether or not uh, the workforce that is here is conducive to other types of threats. Next slide. Okay. Here are some other ones. Let's look at uh, some health factors here. These are, again, just kind of looking at national statistical averages for rural counties in the U.S. Uh, click, please. Uh, there are lower rates of youth without health insurance. It sounds like a double negative. Well, essentially what we're saying is that uh, many of these jobs offer health insurance. Uh, so if you're employed in a mine, odds are that you're getting some kind of health benefits. Uh, a lot of these jobs are actually union-based jobs. And because of that, there are health benefits. I'm not sure about the union rate within the state of Wisconsin. Again, this is kind of a national picture. There are higher rates of people with poor or uh, fair health. Uh, as we become more dependent upon this type of mining, uh, health uh, conditions actually start to deteriorate. Well, we have access to health insurance, actual health conditions start to fail. Next slide. There are higher rates of people with poor physical healthy days. Uh, again, this is uh, this type of work is not conducive to um, uh, good health and living longer. Next slide. And there are also uh, higher rates of people with poor mental health days. So what we've got here is that we've got higher paying jobs, right, benefits in terms of health insurance, but these jobs are not associated with uh, a healthy living. Next slide. Okay, some other social economic characteristics, higher smoking rates, 
Uh, lower obesity rates, that's a weak relationship, not sure about that one. Uh, lower rates of sexually transmitted diseases, that's probably because of access to health care and lower poverty rates. Next one. Uh, lower teen birth rates, again, that might be the poverty relationship here because these are, tend to be good paying jobs. Next one. Uh, but there is a higher number of poor, bare ozone days. Again, there's a health factor here. Uh, there's lots of positive uh, uh, associations with, with this type of mining, these types of mining operations, but there's also some negative on the health side. Next one. Okay. Now, what I want to do then is to look at kind of the impact on growth, because the, the question is, is that are these types of mining jobs associated with economic growth? So what I want to do is I want to look at simply the growth in population, employment, and per capita income. And we're looking at 2000 to 2007. Uh, we stopped at 2007 because that's right after that's when the Great Recession came in, and it just kind of wreaks havoc with our analysis. So we said, let's just look at 2000 to 2007. What I'm going to share with you is the results for the non-adjacent non-metropolitan. These are non-metropolitan counties that are not adjacent to a metropolitan area. The reason that we picked that subset is because those types of counties are more reflective of western and, and central Wisconsin. Next slide, please. Hold on. There we go. Now I'm going to go through all of these in excruciating detail. Um, no, but just, what, the, uh, essentially what I'm showing you here is that this is a, 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 a statistical analysis and I'm trying to control for all these other very characteristics. Next slide. Okay, these are the ones that are of importance. Okay, we've got the mining to population employment ratio. That's what we did all those scatter plots on. We also have mining employment as a share of total employment. Okay, now these are what the results are. Higher dependency of mining for employment in 2000 is associated with Lower rates of population growth. Actually, population growth can go down. The more dependent we are on this type of mining operation, population growth slows down and can go negative. Next one. Faster rates of employment growth. This is, um, there is job growth associated with these things. Next Faster rates of per capita income growth. These tend to be good paying jobs. So it's a, it's, there's growth in employment opportunities. These tend to be good paying jobs. But the problem is that people don't want to live near these things. That's what this particular analysis is showing us. Next slide. Steve, you only have a couple more minutes. Gotcha, almost done. Okay. Okay, so the summary of the plan. Let's go through these quickly. Mining as an industry within the U.S. remains inherently unstable, okay? Through the flickering effect, but the level of instability seems to be declining over time, okay? We, communities have to worry about the instability in the industry. Openings are running, slowing down, running, slowing down. Next one. Ownership structure of the mining company. Are these locally owned operations or are these being run by operations outside of the state of Wisconsin. That's something that's very important because a lot of the profits, and this is a fairly profitable industry, will leave the state if these are non-locally owned companies. Next slide. Uh, there's a growing pool in the academic literature that's called the resource curves. And what this suggests is that robust economic growth and development that's from the resource extraction activities could be considered the exception rather than the rule. The problem, though, is that while you see some employment growth within the industry, you don't see a lot of other growth associated with it. Primarily, it's, it's related to people that want to live next to these things. And secondly, is that uh, the, the human capital, in terms of education levels, is detrimental to other types of growth associated with, with these types of industries. Um, 
communities that are more heavily dependent on mining for employment tend to experience greater negative impacts after the mine closes than positive impacts when the mines are in operation. What we have to do is that we have to plan for when these mines shut down. We've essentially extracted everything out, and now the mine shuts down. There's a lot of studies out there that suggest that when you look pre and post mines opening and mines permanently shutting down, the community is worse off after the mine shuts down. Why? Because of this notion of the resource curse. You don't tend to see other types of economic activity developing in these high mining areas. Next one. Uh, you've got to be careful about making blanket generalizations. Mines are bad for communities. No, there are some positive elements here from, the, from an economist's perspective. There are some positive elements. There are some negative elements. So you got to, it's, it's, it's not a black and white issue. There's shades of gray here. Next one. Uh, the big conclusion that I walk away from with a lot of this is that you will see some employment growth. You will see some growth in income. The problem, though, is that people don't want to live near these things. And that will essentially result in a drag in the long term. That's a serious consideration. Next slide. Um, so some of the things to think about. Are mining operations consistent with other sources of economic activity within the region? For example, uh, because of the increased truck traffic and noise and blowing sand, is that conducive with, say, retirement migration? Is that consistent with trying to build a, a tourism or a recreational housing type economic base? Is it consistent with tourism? We have to see whether or not these things are conflicting and whether or not there is consistency here. Next one. Uh, is the public infrastructure uh, sufficient? One of the problems uh, is the truck traffic. Many of the roads in western Wisconsin, particularly the county roads, this truck traffic will uh, accelerate the deterioration. It's not so much the increase in traffic, although that could be detrimental to tourism, it's the weight of these vehicles. Okay? Is the local community set up in, to pay for the increased deterioration rate of the public infrastructure, particularly the, the road system? Uh, is there a sufficient pool of labor to meet the mining operations? Uh, or are we going to see a lot of incommuting? Okay, who's going to take these jobs? Um, that's, a, that's a question that has been uh, raised by a number of folks. And again, uh, people want the jobs, but they don't want to live next to these things. Next one. Uh, is the community making an adequate investments to build on the economic activity generated by mining operations? The mines are not a silver bullet. The mines can create opportunities to diversify the local economy. Um, that goes back to the resource curves. Once these mines shut down, uh, because they've extracted everything they can extract, the community is oftentimes worse off. What is the community doing to plan for when these mines shut down? Okay. Next one. Is the community learning from the experience of other communities? Um, if the community decides that they are going to allow these types of mines to be to operate, uh, what are some of the best practices? Can communities go out and see what other communities are doing and learn from the experience of other communities? Um, it's really kind of the community needs to do its homework. Next slide. And I believe I went over by one minute. Um, all I'll right. That. Well, good. Thank you. And here is a question for you, Steve. Um, if what you were presenting was a lot of um, metallic mining and non-metallic mining all together in a national data set, what do you think the would the results be different if you took out, for example, Appalachia from your analysis? Uh, it could be. It could be from an economy's perspective. It doesn't matter if you're digging up copper or gold or sink or sand or rocks. The economy doesn't care. What the economy is concerned about is how much money is that bringing into the local community? What kind of jobs are these generating? Whether you're digging up sand or you're digging up gold, 
doesn't matter from the economy's perspective. It may matter from an environmental perspective, but it doesn't matter from an economic perspective. Okay. And then here's one, and I'm going to read it. Uh, in the absence of sand mining, what economic development would be occurring in western Wisconsin? Is the comparison of mining a comparison against no activity versus a comparison to other economic growth, which may not have been happening anyway? I think the key here is, is mining consistent with other types of economic activity. One region or one area has been trying to make farming more profitable, trying to uh, expand markets for agriculture. Um, you've got uh, the local foods movement, which is a viable option for many uh, tracts of land that are not conducive to larger scale farms. Uh, so that's one option. Uh, you also have the, the natural amenities of the area that is attracting a lot of people into the region. Uh, the idea of retirement migration, uh, the idea of recreational housing development, the idea of uh, day trippers, uh, tourism type of development. The question is, is whether or not the communities are being proactive. One of the issues with many western Wisconsin communities is that they've not been very proactive in terms of economic growth and development. So when this mining opportunity presented itself, it was more in a reactive mode than a proactive. So now what folks are essentially saying is that if we are to kind of think about what we want our economy to look like, uh, this has really forced a lot of communities to think, to ask that very question. And that's when folks are starting to say, well, what if we promote tourism? What if we promote agriculture? What if we promote retirement migration? Is mining consistent with these other types of activity? And that's where the question is. That's where it's the, the, the challenge is, how can we have our cake and eat it? And that's where communities need to think. They need to think outside the box a little bit. Good. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all the speakers. We only have uh, about five minutes left. Uh, and so we heard uh, a number of stories here from economics to public health to groundwater to air resources. So it was quite a uh, breadth of information. And of course, we couldn't go deep into any one particular thing, which leads me to a question for people uh, online, is that if you found this interesting, do you think another webinar would be useful? And what are the sorts of topics you might be interested in? And I will send a link to the recording once we, we have it uh, available. Um, I would just like to make one comment. Uh, I'm from the Center for Land Use Education, and I just can't help myself to say, uh, for those of you in counties, cities, villages, towns, as you're updating your comprehensive plans, uh, to think about non-metallic mining uh, and where do, does it fit in. Steve Deller was alluding to that. And once those are updated, think about where non-metallic mining is in your zoning ordinance and what kind of conditional use standards you might want to, to see in those. And what else can I say here? Yes, there. I have asked about uh, the continuing ed through the American Planning Association, and I can also, you should check online, but I will also check with the person at APA to make sure that is uh, done. And so with that, does uh, Carolyn, Christine, any of the speakers, would you like to give any last words here? Uh, Kristen, you're just very happy to be part of this, I think, very important discussion, so thank you. PG? I just, uh, this is Christine from AICG and um, the speakers today. I know. Thank you for everybody. And um, 
it, it, I thought it was very interesting, and yes, we will work on getting a recording of this and connecting to everyone who has registered to get you the link so you can view this at a later time as well. So thank you, everyone, and uh, I think we're right on time, which isn't amazing. <laughs>